In this video, we're going to talk about the theory and practice of Western blotting. So we're going to go through a little bit of why we do all the different steps that we do, and then also talk about practically how to do them in the lab. So the first thing I want to say about Western blots is that they can be a little bit tricky just because they are so long. They usually take two days to do with sort of the standard protocols. And there are many, many different steps and therefore are many different points where something could go wrong. And unfortunately with a Western blot, you don't really visualize your results until the very end. And so if something does go wrong, it's hard to know. And that is why a lot of people have trouble when they first start doing these. But if you go step by step and you sort of troubleshoot every step as you go, it is a pretty straightforward protocol. And once you have some practice, I think it's very doable. So just be very systematic, think every step through and take it slow. Don't rush these when you first start. So now thinking about what Western blots actually are, as you all might know, they're a technique for examining the protein levels of a single protein of interest in a range of samples. So this is not like proteomics, which is the screen we talked about, proteomics or mass spec, where you can measure the levels of every protein in a sample. This is going to be only for specific proteins that you are interested in looking at. So let's start by just doing an overview of this protocol. So the way this works is you will start with some sort of sample. This sample might be cells or it might be a piece of tissue, but you will start with some sort of biological sample and you will extract all of the protein of that sample into a tube. So this is your Eppendorf tube that has all of the protein that was in this tissue or in these cells, all of it is now in this little piece of liquid in your sample. And then you're going to load that sample into a gel. And the gel is basically going to take the sample and it's gonna take every single protein that was in your original cells and it's going to separate them all out by size. And we do this so that the proteins are more accessible and it's easier to determine which protein is our protein of interest and we run a ladder alongside it so that we can know which size corresponds to which location on the gel. Once we have this gel, which now has again all of the proteins that were originally in these samples, they're all in this gel, but they're separated by size. Now we take this gel and we put it against a membrane and we basically want to transfer all the proteins that are in the gel to a membrane. And we do this because it's very hard to work with the proteins in the gel, but it's much easier to work with them when they're on this membrane, and then we can stain and look at the proteins that we're interested in. So once you're on the membrane, we're then gonna make sure to block, and we'll talk about why we do that later, but basically it prevents nonspecific binding. And then we add in our antibodies. And so you can see here that they've added in their antibodies, and these antibodies are going to go and look at the protein that we specifically care about. So the important thing to realize is that although every single protein is on this blot or on this membrane, you can only look at whatever you have an antibody against. So your antibody needs to be against one thing that you are interested in looking at, and it will be labeled, and then you will put it on the membrane, and then you'll visualize where that antibody shows up. And so that's what this is. And that is how you will determine the levels of that one antibody that you're interested in, or that one gene that you're interested in, based on where that antibody bound on the blot. So let's talk first about how we actually prepare these samples. So as I just said, you will start with your cells or a tissue sample and you will isolate the pellet of those cells. You're then gonna wash those cells with PBS. So this is all just like regular TC, you're basically isolating a clean pellet of cells. But then instead of replating those cells or doing experiments with them, you are going to use them for further assays. And so you're going to remove all of the PBS and you're going to add M per buffer, or some people use NP40 buffer, in order to extract all of the proteins that are in this sample. So you'll resuspend in this buffer and then you'll vortex or you'll follow the manufacturer's protocols for whatever buffer you are using. And usually that will involve a spin where all of the 
debris of the cell gets spun down to the bottom and what's left at the top, the liquid at the top, is your protein. So in a lot of cases, we end up throwing out the liquid at the top. But in this case, the liquid on the top, or the supernatant, is your protein, and it is what you're interested in. So it's very important that you take that out and you throw away the pellet at the bottom. So now you have your protein sample. And let's say that we have three different protein samples here. The next thing we're going to do is run a BCA assay. And this is basically an assay that colors the sample based on the protein concentration. So you put in a number of known protein concentration standards, and you put in your samples that you're interested in determining the protein concentration for. And we do this because it's very important that every sample has the exact same amount of protein. Because if we're comparing protein levels from one sample to another, we want to make sure that at baseline they all have the same amount of protein, so then if one protein is down, we can say that that's because of the effect of our condition and not because that sample overall just has less protein. So you do want to make sure that every single sample has the same protein, and this assay allows us to determine the protein concentration so that then we can then calculate how to actually make samples that are all the exact same concentration. So once you have your protein amounts, you're then gonna add SDS into your samples along with water to make your final samples, which will be blue samples that have SDS in them and that are normalized. And these are samples that are ready to load. So a good thing to keep in mind is that if you are loading a sample into a gel to run a Western blot, it should be blue in color because it should have SDS in it. And SDS is important because it allows us to linearize the proteins. So proteins and cells are always formed into shapes, but we want to make sure that they're linearized so that they migrate to the correct size and they act properly in our Western blots. So if you're loading a sample, it should be blue. And if it's blue, it means that somebody has gone ahead and normalized it and added in the SDS. And so now all you have to do is boil the sample to complete the denaturing and linearizing process and then load it into your gel. Okay, so now that we have our samples ready and they've been equalized, right? So we got our samples and we equalized them. And then we added in the SDS and made the appropriately concentrated samples. We are now going to be ready to actually run the gel and do the Western blot workflow. So the first thing to make sure you understand is why we do each of these steps. So the first step, once you have your samples prepared, is to load them into a gel and perform gel electrophoresis. And as we talked about, we do this because we would like to separate the proteins by size. We then transfer to a membrane and again, we do this because it's much easier to stain with antibodies on this membrane than it is to stain directly onto the gel. And then we block with a blocking buffer. In our case, we use 5% milk, but there are other blocking buffers that you can use. So when you block, you're basically covering all of the empty spaces that don't have proteins on this membrane. You're covering them with a general protein solution so that then your antibodies don't bind non-specifically and you get a clean background. You're then going to incubate with your primary antibody. And so this is the antibody that is specifically directed against the protein that you are interested in looking at. So let's say that I am interested in looking at P53. This will be a antibody that is directed specifically to P53. So its variable region is P53 and its constant region will be whatever animal it was raised in. So for example, this could be a rabbit anti-P53 antibody, which means that it is directed against P53 and it is made in rabbit. We will usually do this overnight at four degrees to make sure that the antibody binds cleanly and has enough time to bind. We're then gonna wash with a wash buffer, which is usually a TDST-based buffer. And this is usually done three times for 10 minutes at least. Some labs recommend doing longer. Then we incubate with a secondary antibody. We do this typically for one to two hours. 
at room temperature. And the secondary antibody is going to be an antibody that is directed against the species of your primary antibody. Now that is because, and this is very important to understand, you want to form a chain with your primary antibody because your primary antibody is bound to your protein of interest, but you have no way of seeing it. The secondary antibody has a tag, so you can imagine there's a tag right here, and this tag is what is allowing you to see where the primary is. So it has to go ahead and bind to the primary. So this, if this is our primary, this rabbit anti P53, then our secondary has to be made in a different species because we don't want it to bind to itself. And then it has to be anti-rabbit. So this is made where the variable region is actually directed at this constant region that is from rabbits. And then it's made an entirely different species to avoid any cross reactions. So we'll go over this again in a second, but this is a very important concept for understanding how Western bots work. Once we've incubated with the secondary, and we imagine that our antibodies have formed nice chains like this on our blot, we then wash again. And this wash is usually more aggressive, so we do three times 15 to 20 minutes to really make sure that we get any background off. And then we can detect the bands using whatever reporter was on our original antibody. So these are commonly HRP reporters, which means that you add another chemical on top of it, which makes the HRP react and light up, and that's how you're able to visualize your bands. So now that we've kind of gone over the workflow, let's talk about actually doing it step by step. So. The first step, once you've made your samples, is to perform gel electrophoresis. And that is the part where you run your samples through a gel to separate by size. So this is run through gel, separate by size. That's what you're doing here. So the important considerations here are that you make sure you set up your chamber correctly and that you use the right percent of gels. So we'll talk about this in the next slide, how to choose the percent. You want to make sure you use a running buffer on top, so the buffer that is appropriate to run your gels, and that you remove the plastic ladder from inside the gels. You're then going to clean out the wells and load in your ladder and samples and 1x SDS buffer, which is used as a blank solution. So for this part, you do want to make sure that you write down in advance what the order of the samples is going to be because once they're inside the gel, they will all look the same. And if you're running multiple gels, you're gonna to wanna to keep track of which gel has which samples in it. So I'll often make a diagram, something like this, with all my different wells, and I'll write down exactly what is going in every single well. And you have to make sure that your first one has a ladder. You can never ever run a Western blot without a ladder, because if you have no ladder, then you don't know what the different sizes of the proteins are and where they are on the gel. You also want to make sure that you have all of your samples of interest and then any remaining extra um, wells that you have should be filled with some sort of blank solution to make sure that there's an even amount of solution in all the wells. And so we typically use 1x SDS buffer to match the rest of the samples. And to be clear, a ladder, if you're not sure what that is, it's just a marker that runs down the side of your gel that tells you where all the different protein sizes are. So then it will tell you, for example, this is 30 and this is 60. So now you know that if I see a protein here, it's at approximately 55. So once you've done this and you've set up your gel, you'll fill the rest of the chamber with running buffer and then usually we'll start running around 40 or 45 volts just to get it all stacked up together and in a straight line. And then once your samples are in a straight line and they've kind of moved out of the wells, you can go ahead and put it up to 100 volts and run it for about 60 minutes. So this is a great video from Thermo that sort of goes through the whole process. So here you can see that he's pulling out his gel and that little blue bottle is going to be the SDS buffer. And now you can imagine that this is your sample and you have all of your lysate proteins in this sample. You've added SDS and you've sort of denatured them. 
and you've made them charged correctly. So now they're ready to go into your gel and be separated by size. These are all the different types of gels you could have. And so now this person is ready to actually load their gel. They have all their samples prepared and their gel prepared. And now they're gonna get it all set up. So this is them adding the SDS into their samples, which as we talked about, reduces and charges the proteins correctly. They're going to go ahead and boil them for 5 to 10 minutes to really complete that reducing and denaturing process. And now they're filling in their running buffer all the way to the tops of the wells. You can see that they go all the way to the top and they fill the outside chamber as well. And now he's going ahead and loading his samples. And so you can see we use these long tips to load. And you want to really be very even with your loading. You want to make sure that nothing goes outside. We usually use about 25 to 30 microliters in our gels, but it depends on your gel size that you're using. And then this is their ladder that they're adding. And remember, you never want to run a gel without a ladder. And now they're going ahead and starting it. And you can start at about 40 and then take it up to 100 or even higher. And once a gel has been successfully started, you should see bubbles rising in it, as you see here, and that tells you that your gel is actually running. So once it's done, you will stop the gel, and then you'll move on to the next steps of actually transferring it. So as a quick aside, I just want to talk about why you would have different percentages of gels. And the reason is that depending on the percent composition of your gel, different proteins will show up better. So for example, lower percent gels, as you can see here, tend to resolve large proteins better. So you can see how your large proteins are very separated here, but all your small proteins are just gone. Whereas gradient gels or higher percentage gels will show you all of your proteins, but you won't get the same separation of large proteins, but you will be able to see all the small proteins. So. This is usually a decision of what kinds of proteins you're probing for and what their size is. And depending on what you need to see and how separated you need it to be, you can choose the appropriate percentage. Most labs will have 10% gels and also 4 to 20% gels fairly commonly, and both provide a pretty decent overview of the entire spectrum of protein sizes. So now that we run our gel and our proteins are fully separated by size, we're going to be ready to the next step, which is transferring them to a nitrocellulose membrane. So what I want you to remember is that for a successful transfer, this is specifically for a semi-dry transfer, which is what we do in our lab, you need three things. You need your gel that has been pulled out of the contraption and soaked in transfer buffer. You need a membrane, a nitrocellulose membrane, that has been first labeled and then activated in methanol. These are both very, very important. If you do not label your membrane, you will not know what that membrane is from. And if it is not activated in methanol, your transfer will not work. So first labeled, then activated, and then soaked in transfer buffer. This activation should be for under five minutes, and then you can put it in transfer buffer. And then finally, you will need filter papers, two thick ones or four thin ones, soaked in transfer buffer. So once you have all these components ready, you will set up a sandwich just like this. This is going to be the base. You're going to put filter paper, either one thick one or two thin ones, followed by your membrane that you're transferring onto, which again has been labeled and activated, followed by your gel, followed by your last piece of filter paper. That is your transfer sandwich. And you can see here, this is what it looks like in real life. This is the machine, and this is the surface, and then that is the bottom filter paper, and this person is adding their membrane on top. Once you have your sandwich constructed, you want to make sure that you use a rolling, something to roll with. We use pipettes to roll across or any sort of flat thing to roll across. 
to make sure that you eliminate any bubbles in your sandwich. If there are bubbles in here during the transfer, then some proteins won't transfer. And if those happen to be the proteins that you want to look at, um, you will have bubbles in your stain, which will mean you'll have to redo the whole thing again. So it's very important to roll across and make sure that there are no bubbles. And then you also want to make sure that this entire area is fully dried off. So it will get wet as you're setting up your transfer because all of these things have been soaked in transfer buffer. But you want to make sure to fully dry it off without disrupting your actual sandwich because the semi-dry transfer will not work unless this entire area is dry. So once it's dry, you can put the machine back together and then go ahead and run for one hour at 14 volts. The one hour is important because you don't want to overrun this. The proteins will start running through the membrane into the filter paper. So do one hour exactly. That's usually enough to get all of your proteins. And you do want to check this transfer machine and make sure it's actually running about a minute or two after you start it. Because sometimes with um, this surface not being quite dry enough, it can start and then stop. So always make sure you double check that your transfer is actually happening. Once the transfer is over, you once again open up the machine, you double check your membrane and make sure that the proteins have actually transferred onto the membrane. And you will know that by looking at your ladder because you will see that your ladder has transferred onto the membrane. And if it has, then you're ready to move forward. So you can throw away the gel and now your membrane is what has all the proteins on it. So we went from sample to gel, where all the proteins were separated by size, to now membrane. And this is where our proteins are going to stay. It has all of the proteins from our sample on this membrane. So now we want to make sure that we block. And we do this because our membrane has proteins on it at specific places, like this. But it also has a lot of empty white space where there is no protein. And if we were to put antibodies onto this right now, they would bind non-specifically to a lot of this empty space because this membrane is just very sticky to protein. So we want to make sure that we put some sort of broad coverage of protein across this entire membrane so that antibodies cannot bind non-specifically. So we typically use 5% milk made in the same buffer that we wash in later, and we do one hour at room temperature. And typically, it's a good idea to rinse off the transfer buffer before you start blocking. So we just do a quick rinse in water. And then we block for an hour. And this is just to show you the difference between an unblocked and a blocked membrane. So this membrane has been blocked and it's nice and clean. You can clearly see your proteins of interest. Whereas this one has a lot of nonspecific binding, a lot of black on the background. It's very hard to see the proteins that you're interested in. So like I said, a good idea to always block. The next step is going to be an antibody incubation. And for this step, we can only put the membrane into one antibody solution. So if you are interested in staining for multiple antibodies on one membrane, then you will have to cut that membrane to the appropriate size. So for example, let's look at this diagram and let's say that we were interested in one protein that had a size of 37 kilodaltons and one that had a size of 120. Then to separate these two, we can cut this at exactly 70 and then our 37 will be captured on this bottom piece because you can see by the ladder that 37 would be right here and our 120 will be captured up here on this top piece. So cutting the membrane into pieces is a great way to get more than one antibody out of one membrane. You can also do what's called stripping the membrane after the fact, and sometimes that's another way if you have two or three very good quality antibodies, you can strip off the antibodies from the first Western blot and rerun other Western blots and restain for other proteins of interest on the same membrane, which means that it saves you from running the gel and the transfer all over again, and it can allow you to use the same sample for multiple proteins. But if possible, it's always nicer to do it on a fresh blot and just cut that blot into the correct size pieces. So once you have cut your membrane up to the appropriate sizes, 
you go ahead and put it into the antibody solutions that you're interested in. And we typically do primaries overnight, followed by washes, followed by secondaries, followed by washes, and then we visualize. So the important thing to realize is what we talked about before here, which is that your primary and your secondary do have to form chains. So here we'll pretend that this target protein is P53. And this is our rabbit anti-P53 antibody, which means this is specific to P53, and this is the rabbit common region. So for our secondary to form an appropriate chain with this primary, it has to be a secondary that is specific to the rabbit common chain. So that means this specific part of this antibody is actually going to be directed against the rabbit FC region. And it will be made in a totally separate species, perhaps goats, so that there is no cross-reaction. And then this is also linked to a special reporter so that we can use a detection signal to detect where this is binding. And this is basically what is allowing us to visualize where the primary is binding. So it's very important that this species and this species match up so they form that chain. And then once you have done that, then as we talked about, it's very easy to visualize. You use that reporter construct on the second antibody and you add in this chemical called ECL and that creates a reaction that results in a lighting up of the HRP that is conjugated to your antibody. And that light can sort of be detected by a special detector or by film. And so then we're able to get these Western blots, as you can see here, where you can see black lines to indicate where the antibody was binding. I want to make a special note here of beta-actin, because beta-actin is very, very important in Western blotting. Beta-actin is a protein that is a structural protein in a cell, which means every cell should have a generally similar amount of beta-actin. And so it is what we use as a loading control because even though we made all of our samples have the exact same amount of protein at the beginning, it's always possible that something got messed up or that when we loaded, some protein was lost. And so we didn't actually load the exact same amount of protein into every single well. And so you always wanna show a beta actin or other replacements for this would include tubulin or GAP-DH. These are all sort of housekeeping cytoskeleton genes that are relatively constant across all cells and that allow you to show that you actually do have the exact same amount of protein in every single cell so that you can then draw conclusions about changes in other proteins, right? Because if I had very, very little beta-actin, like let's say this second line was actually a beta-actin and this sample has almost no beta-actin, then if I saw a decrease in the protein of interest, I would have to conclude that that was because there was no protein in the sample at all and not because there's actually a decrease due to my condition. So beta-actin is a very important housekeeping gene to make sure that every single sample has the same amount of protein. So here I just want to show some quick examples of Western blots in general. And so you can see that all of these Westerns have an appropriate loading control attached to them to show that everything is the same. And then they look at a gene of interest. And the way you interpret a Western blot is really very simple. Once you've determined that all of the samples have the same amount of protein based on the loading control, you basically look at the size or the darkness of the band to determine how much protein there is. So for example, I would say that protein two here, or sample two here, has far more PARP1 than sample one. Or you could say that RUNX2 is knocked down in this sample as compared to it's relatively higher in this sample. When you see multiple bands for a protein, sometimes it means that that protein has a modification on it. So perhaps this is phosphorylation or some other modification of P27. So it's showing two bands. But you can again see that there's a very appropriate loading control shown. And then here you can see that you know, these four samples just have no expression of this protein, whereas these four do. So it's quite a simple interpretation, but the important thing is to make sure that there is a loading control so that you can make that interpretation. I also want to talk briefly about how you present data. So normally when we run a Western blot, what we get is something like this. 
this picture right here. These labels, of course, have been added, and this ladder has been added on the side to help you, but this is what you will see. And so it is your job to match up your ladder and determine where your protein of interest is. So let's say that in this case, we match the ladder to our sample, and we saw that our protein of interest is at 35 kilodaltons, so it should be right here. And then we also matched up our labels so we know what each of these rows represents. So now the way to actually present this data is to show it how we saw in the previous slide. So we need to make sure that we add in our actin. So this is the actin that goes with this. And we also need to make sure that we crop out and really focus on the band that we are interested in showing so we don't distract our readers with all these other bands that are nonspecific. So the way to do that is to show that you check the ladder size by putting the correct size next to the protein and then cropping down to the protein that you are interested in showing and labeling it very well with the name and all the sample names across the top clearly lined up with the sample and with the actin. So this is a much cleaner, precise blot compared to this large uncaught blot, and this is how blots should really be presented. As a quick note, if you're unsure about the size of the antibody or the size of the protein that you're looking at, you can usually find it on the website for the antibody that you bought. It's usually in their sample data and in their specs, and so you should always check what size they report, and that's the size that you should try to match. And then finally, I'd just like to end on some simple practice examples of how you might use these skills. So let's say that your mentor comes in and tells you, I want you to run a Western to check the knockdown efficiency of numb. So in this case, if you were running this Western, you would wanna make sure that in your, la in your sample design that you include your ladder, as we talked about, you include a control, and then you include the knockdowns for numb that you have. And then all the rest of your wells and your gels should have blinks. Numb is 100 kilodaltons, and we know that actin is somewhere around 37 kilodaltons, or 42 kilodaltons, so around this green line right here. So there is more than enough room between our 100 line and this green line for us to make a nice cut. So we only need to run one gel and one membrane. We can cut this up and we can stain for both. And then in terms of antibodies we will use, we know that we will need a numb antibody and an actin antibody, and that will be sufficient for that experiment. Now let's talk about a more complicated example. Let's say that your mentor comes in and tells you that I have three samples and I want you to run all of these different proteins, plus actin, of course. So this is a little more complicated because you have two proteins here that are high weights, you have CMYK, which is 60, which just falls in between, and then you have cyclin D3, which is 31. But it's going to be very hard for you to separate 31 on this, which might be somewhere around here, and the 42, which is the actin, which is somewhere around here. And it's also going to be very hard to separate 100 and 110. So this is a case where you might need two or three gels that have the same samples, or you might need to strip one membrane over and over again if these antibodies are very good quality in order to get all of these different samples. An important thing to keep in mind though is that if you strip, you need to make sure that when you cut the first time that you still have both sizes on your piece. So like if I cut right here, I would be able to stain for both numb and notch, but if I cut right here, I couldn't stain for both actin and cyclin. So I would have to cut somewhere around here. So that's just an important thing to keep in mind, to think very carefully about what you're going to stain for and how it might overlap and the fact that you might need multiple gels or you might need multiple rounds of stripping. And then finally, another simpler example is just running a blot to check expression of notch at different time points of TMZ treatment. And so the point I want to make here is just that you cannot do more than nine samples in a 10 well gel because you have nine samples plus your ladder. So whatever time points you choose, they have to be under nine samples. 
in order to make sure that you can fit them on one gel because you cannot compare Western blots across multiple gels. They have to be run on the same gel and they have to be on the same membrane. So it's an important thing to think about the limits of your gel. So perhaps you can get a 15 well gel and then you will have more places to put these samples and can run more time points. But if you have only 10 wells, then you only have nine samples, which means you can do perhaps four different time points of control versus TMZ treatment. That will give you eight samples in total, plus one for the latter and one left over. So it is important to also think about how you're going to plan out that gel and fit everything you need to into one blot as well. So that's where we'll end for today on understanding the basics of Western blots. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe to our channel. We'll keep posting videos on basic um, experimental protocols and overviews for new scientists. And also please feel free to follow us at the lab Twitter at AhmedLabNW. Thank you so much for listening today.